Okiano Vox. The following story is a story told to me by my granddad. And he told me this before he passed away. So I thought you might be able to appreciate it. This story is really long. So if you don't want to read the full story, I suggest skipping the first two paragraphs. I'm not a World War II buff, but I'm just telling the story the way I rem remember hearing it. Some dates and locations may be slightly off. My grandpa was a British infantryman in the Second World War. He was only about 19 years old when he enlisted to serve his country. And while he thought that joining the military would give him opportunities to see exotic locations around the world, he was never deployed to Tunisia or Italy or the Pacific. Instead, he ended up practically in his own backyard, Switzerland. This is just some historical information, but it's important for us to understand before reading the rest of the story. Switzerland did its best to maintain neutral status throughout the war, but regardless of its attempt to maintain neut neutrality, Switzerland was still highly sought after by both the Allied and the Axis powers. Once the Nazis began committing acts of aggression against Switzerland, England provided reinforcements to the Swiss military, yet in an effort to prevent open war within its borders, the Swiss government instructed its military and subsequently the British reinforcements to perform a series of tactical retreats into the Alps. That's how my grandfather found himself stationed in a remote village in the Swiss Alps. At this time, it was the early winter of 1943 and my grandpa's company was stationed in a secluded village of about 500 people. Part of the advantage that they had with this location was that it was really hard to get to. Therefore, had little chance of being spontaneously invaded by Nazi Germany, but this was also a disadvantage because it made communication with the rest of the Swiss military very difficult. The issue with communication was further compounded when sometime in early December, a series of blizzards swept through the region and completely destroyed the few lines of communication that they had in the first place. So, essentially trapped in the isolated Swiss village without being able to make contact with the rest of the army, my granddad's captain decided it would be best to uphold the standing orders and continue defending the village. Weeks passed. Any roads to the outside world were buried in seven to nine feet of dense snowfall and any telegraph phone lines that they had were equally useless. It grew deeper into winter. The leaves were stripped from the trees and the bare trunks protruded from the mountainside like broken ribs. The town was nestled between two large mountains. Sunlight only directly reached the town for a few hours each day, making the soldiers feel as if they were living in a state of perpetual dusk. One night, my grandpa was at the town bar with a few of his friends from the company, and a group of the locals approached him. One of them in particular was very, very upset. All of the Swiss people in the town grew up speaking German, but none of them were used to having Brits around, so one of them started shouting in broken English, Where you take children? Luckily, one of the guys my grandpa was drinking with spoke fluent German, and he was able to act as an impromptu translator. After several minutes of confusion and yelling, the translator turned to, to my grandpa and the rest of the soldiers and said, they say that some of the village children have gone missing. They want us to do something about it. Now, obviously, the military doesn't exactly act as a bunch of mercenaries for hire. So my grandfather and his friends told the villagers to come back to the headquarters, which was just really a makeshift barracks that they'd thrown together in the town's church to talk to the captain. Due to the language barrier, the village's discussion with the captain took about two hours and basically what the captain and his self-designated translator were able to piece together was that a few weeks after the company entered the village, the locals had noticed a variety of bizarre incidents. At first, it was just benign stuff like vanishing pieces of wooden tarp from people's sheds. But over the following two months, people realised that valuable items were being stolen from their homes. One man claimed that his family heirloom a handmade ceremonial halberd, sort of like a trad traditional Swiss war axe, had disappeared from above his mantel place. The culmination of all these incidents was when a village child went missing. Of course, many assumed that the child's disappearance, although tragic and disconcerting, could be attributed to something as simple as the boy falling into a local snowdrift while playing outside, or possibly being attacked and killed by a wolf or another predatory animal. But there wasn't only one child that disappeared. 
there were several. The villager who entered the bar who looked especially upset. That was the father of the two young boys who had gone missing two days before. He had searched everywhere for them, even rounded up a posse of his own fellow townspeople to join the effort, but they couldn't find a single clue as to what had happened to the children. The captain told the villagers that he would continue to look into the matter and that he would begin sending some of his own men to patrol the streets each night to look for whoever or whatever was the culprit behind all these strange thefts and abductions. Later that night, Private Reginald disappeared from the barracks. Disappearing children was one thing, but a grown man, it seemed very unlikely that an animal, even a wolf, could take down a fully grown, healthy man on its own. Naturally, rumours began to surface and that there was some sort of monster living in the mountains that came down at night to feast on the occupants of the village. Despite the nightly patrols ordered by the captain, the disappearances kept occurring. Reginald was the only adult victim of whatever was preying on the village. The rest of the victims were all young kids between the ages of five and ten. All in all, including the three original children who had gone missing, seven children vanished from the town. Many people in my grandpa's company were growing suspicious. One explanation that got passed around was the impoverished villagers were actually selling their own children to human traffickers for extra cash. But that didn't make sense because the roads into the village and out were still blocked by snow. Three more weeks passed without incident. At this point, it was early spring and the snow started to thaw. That night, coincidentally, when my grandpa was on patrol with several other soldiers, they discovered what was behind the disappearance of the children and Reginald. It was some time past midnight when my grandpa and his comrades noticed a figure peering through the bedroom window of one of the villagers' houses. My grandpa was at the opposite end of the street, so at first, the figure looking through the window didn't see the patrol. My grandpa and the other soldiers yelled at the prowler, and it immediately tore itself away from the window and began running away. Everyone in the patrol was certain that this was the reason behind the disappearances and break-ins. They ran as fast as they could in pursuit, through the melting snow and ice, in the dead of night, screaming at whatever it was to stop. They kept running and running, and soon they found themselves on the outskirts of town, where the snow f was still fairly deep. That figure jumped into the ground. It looked like it had just vanished into thin air at first, but as the patrol grew closer, they realised that the prowler had actually just jumped into a cave that had been hollowed out in the side of a snowdrift. Just as the soldiers began yelling into the cave for the figure to come out and show itself, several gunshots exploded out of the entrance to the snow cave. Without thinking, my grandpa and the rest of the patrol shouldered their weapons and began firing back into the hole, and then there was silence. They waited for what seemed like hours, but it was probably just a couple of minutes. One incredibly brave member of the patrol volunteered to climb into the cave and investigate what was going on. He drew his pistol kneeled down and then crawled into the cave. Several seconds later, he emerged with a completely horrified expression on his face. My grandpa took out the flashlight and shined it into the cave when he saw the gruesome explanation behind the strange occurrences in the town. The figure that they had been chasing was Reginald, the private who had gone missing weeks before. They had shot Reginald right through the heart the cave was not only occupied by Reginald, but also the bodies of several partially eaten children. Either due to stress of being snowed in all winter, living in near constant darkness, or some sort of terrible mental issue, Reginald had gone completely insane and he began breaking into the villagers' houses and, and snatching children from their homes in the middle of the night. He had used the halberd that had reportedly gone missing to dismember the bodies after he, well, he slit the children's throats and hid them in the cave he carved into the snowdrift. And that was the story of my grandpa, stationed in the Swiss Alps during World War II.